would be great. Um, I'd like also to be able to share my screen, but I'm not seeing where to do that here. So I'm just going to go with, uh, hopefully you're seeing my face. So this is a talk that I gave a couple of weeks ago on reasoning in conceptual spaces by explicit algorithms, strengths, and limitations. It was for a conference in Flemingsbury in Stockholm on the subject of conceptual spaces theory, which is a development of or extension to Eleanor Roche's work with prototypes going back to the early 1970s. What I have tried to do with my own research in conceptual spaces is to take the basic framework offered by prototype theory and conceptual spaces theory to show how all of uh, conceptual agents various concepts come together within a single unified conceptual framework where every concept within that framework is dependent on every other concept. That's the one innovation that I've tried to bring in with uh, my own unified conceptual space theory. The other one is what I'm primarily going to talk about today which is the attempt to develop an explicit algorithm for specifying both the formation and the destruction of concepts within, or the evolution, if you will, of concepts within this unified conceptual space framework. Uh, so a quick introduction to the topic of conceptual spaces and the unified conceptual space theory. I'll talk a bit about the algorithm that I'm using in the Unified Conceptual Space Theory. That will be the bulk of the talk. And finish with something on the strengths and limitations of the uh, approach that I'm using. Uh, and the strengths and limitations, I should say, of explicit algorithms in general. Uh, and it's unfortunate that I can't actually screen share the screen to you at the moment, but hopefully I'll figure that out for the next time that I'm doing this. So, uh, I want to go through a few driving intuitions first that feed my research in this area of philosophy of mind and consciousness studies. First of all, uh, there is the, the basic understanding that I have that concepts and conceptual frameworks intellectualize the world. They take the world and they fit it into a nice intellectual, rational framework for us. At the same time, it's very easy to over-intellectualize what our concepts and conceptual frameworks are doing. In particular, there's an important distinction to be made between concepts when we reflect on them and concepts when we get on with using them non-reflectively. Indeed, there's very good reason to believe that these are quite different things. Concepts appear to be nice, simple, representational objects when we reflect on them. Yes, when we are possessing and employing them non-reflectively, as we must surely be doing most of the time, they must logically, it would seem, be something else. And then the model I would propose is that of a non-representational ability. But if this is right, if concepts are these quite different things when we're reflecting on them and when we're just using them, then there can't be one single correct account of concepts. There cannot be one single correct theory of concepts. And indeed, any particular theory of concepts is going to have to evolve as it goes along uh, for reasons that I will talk about a bit later. Concepts, regardless of whatever they are concepts of, follow a remarkably consistent pattern. And, and this is one of the other driving intuitions here. Uh, they observe uh, an, an indeed remarkably consistent structure, no matter, as I say, what their concepts of, whether that be objects or actions, events or properties, whether they be f uh, concrete and physical or abstract and highly m obviously mental things. Nevertheless, their, their structure is remarkably similar. <laughs> 
I think. Uh, and they fall into one of a very few broad proto-categories. Namely, they are either objects, either concrete or abstract objects, or they are action event type things, or they are properties of either objects of one kind or another or action events of one kind or another. Concepts, furthermore, are independent of and prior to language. Uh, so even though our language abilities clearly extend our conceptual abilities, they, they allow us to think more abstract thoughts, they allow us to take our existing concepts and push them in more abstract directions, they allow us to share our concepts much more freely with each other in a social context. Nevertheless, uh, concepts and conceptual agency are, I think, independent of and prior to language. And indeed, that's been one of the, the driving points that I've been making throughout my, my research for the last five years. Um, concepts, furthermore, can be described at multiple levels. And uh, if the idea that concepts and language pull apart is a bit, un, uh, is a bit controversial, so is this idea that concepts can be described at the level of the individual, that is, at the psychological level, but they can also be described at the level of the group, that is, the sociological level, at the level of the society, that is, the linguistic level, at the level of the species, that is, the anthropological level. All of these levels, we can talk about concepts, and they are the same concepts, and yet they're not quite the same concepts. So there's the same structure, I think, uh, regardless of which level that we're on, individual, group, society, species. At the same time, you know, we have, we have our shared concepts as part of a society, as part of a group within that society. There's also clear differences between one individual's concept of whatever, a dog or happiness or democracy and another person's. So concepts can be described on all these different levels, individual, group, uh, spe uh, society, species. Uh, and one last driving intuition here, and, and very important, is the idea that concepts and consciousness are two sides of one single coin. That is, we attribute conceptual agency pretty much whenever we are inclined to attribute some degree of consciousness and vice versa. We attribute consciousness when we are inclined to attribute some degree of conceptual agency, some ability for conceptually structured thought. And so intuitions about and understandings of the level of conceptual agency and consciousness across species are largely, if not entirely, consistent with each other. Um, so, now I want to talk about some of my motivations uh, with, with the research in the Unified Conceptual Space Theory. Uh, first of all, um, you know, I, I was drawn from the beginning by the mathematical language that Peter Yerdenforsch uh, uses in his conceptual space theory to reframe Eleanor Roche's prototype theory. Uh, at the same time, I really appreciate that Yerdenforsch is taking a, a scaffolding type approach. He's not trying to describe an entire theory with all of the details. He's providing a framework and then inviting other people to fill in the details that's what I am trying to do with my own work in the unified conceptual space theory. I felt that conceptual spaces theory was clearly lacking the framework of a unified space and that it needed one. It seems self-evident to me that our concepts do not exist in isolation, but are very much interdependent on one another so that no concept in our conceptual repertoire is entirely removed from any other concept in that repertoire. Uh, I wanted to do something that could satisfy both my appetite for theoretical elegance and simplicity and actually allow me to build something, which I, I did already with my doctoral uh, thesis, and I've been trying to get some research money ever since to develop further and do some empirical studies on. 
Um, I also wanted some way to address what I see as the failure of formal logics to date to do much to describe how people actually reason. So as a idealization of how people reason, then formal logics clearly have their place. But as a description of actual reasoning, they appear to break down. A lot of logicians would like to put the blame for this on people's reasoning. I would rather turn things around and put the blame on the formal logics and say that we need to develop new formal logics. So that's part of my motivation here. Uh, even though the work that I'm going to go on to describe to you is not at this point at the level of introducing a new formal logic. That is where I would like to get to. Uh, so a few basic principles about my approach, the unified conceptual space theory. First of all, regardless of level, that is the individual, the group, the society, the species, Regardless of conceptual domain, essentially all concepts have three integral dimensions in common. And by integral dimensions, I mean that we can't give a value along one dimension without giving a value on another dimension. So the first of these uh, integral dimensions that all of our concepts have in common is what I call the, the dimension of abstraction. Uh, concepts can be categorized in terms of their degree of concreteness or abstraction. Um, secondly, the dimension of generality. Concepts can be categorized in terms of their degree of specific specificity, generality. This clearly relates to abstraction but is different from. Uh, and finally, the dimension of similarity. Concepts can be categorized in terms of their similarity or dissimilarity to other concepts with respect to the more specific integral dimensions they have in common. So all concepts have these three integral dimensions in common, but many concepts have more finely detailed integral dimensions in common as well. We use those in order to determine their similarity. These three dimensions of abstraction, generality, and similarity together constitute a space of spaces within which essentially all concepts can be located. Physical space and the temporal plane, as I call it, can then be seen as derived from this most general spaces, uh, space of spaces. And I call it the temporal plane because you can draw one line from the past to the future, but you can make uh, another dimension, which is all of the various alternative possibilities at any given moment in time, all the possible branch paths that time and space could take under different circumstances to the ones we observe. That's what creates the what I call the temporal plane, and then physical space likewise should be seen as derivative of a general conceptual space. Uh, every point in the unified conceptual space simultaneously constitutes a subspace. What do I mean by that? Well, one of the points in this unified space is going to be a point for color, but color itself describes a subspace defined by the integral dimensions of, for example, hue, saturation, and brightness. That's a common way that many cultures have of conceptualizing color. There are three basic uh, connectors between points within the uh, unified space, adjacent points. One of these is uh, an ISA connector. So along the axis of generality, we can think of a poodle being a kind of dog, being a kind of mammal, being a kind of animal, being a kind of living organism. Second type of connector then is inclusive or. This is for the axis uh, uh, of abstraction where any point uh, along the uh, axis of abstraction is describing the same object or the same conceptual object at different levels of abstraction, but they're all inclusive with each other. They're not exclusive to each other along the axis of abstraction. So uh, an is a link along the axis of generality, 
uh, an inclusive or link along the axis of abstraction, and finally, exclusive or along the uh, dimension of similarity. So uh, a color is either blue or uh, green, uh, or it's going to be some intermediate color we designate between the two, but a color cannot be two different things uh, in the space at the same time. Um, so three basic connectors, is a inclusive or an exclusive or, three basic kinds of entities. There are objects, both concrete and abstract. There are action events, uh, actions when we uh, ascribe some intentionality to them, events when they just happen. And finally, properties, properties of ob objects, properties of actions or events. There are three basic relations uh, that uh, uh, concepts have to each other. So some concepts are components of other concepts. Some uh, concepts decompose into uh, simpler elements. So uh, for example, uh, the human body uh, has certain components, uh, essential components, including, uh, at least for a living human body, uh, including at least a head and a torso. Uh, other uh, components of the human body may be optional, but those can't be missing. Uh, and when we're talking about um, objects as components of each other, the order um, always uh, seems to matter. We, we can't just put the parts together in any order and came, come up with the same thing. Uh, no, if the uh, parts go in a different order, we end up with something else uh, if we end up with anything coherent. Uh, some components may be optional. These are what uh, psychology describes as separable dimensions, and Yerdenforsch borrows that terminology from psychology. Uh, so when we're talking about uh, the concept of the living human body, uh, the head and the torso are, are integral uh, components, but the arms and legs are separable components because uh, they can be removed and uh, at least in principle the the uh, organism continue living. Uh, so at least some of the components have to be necessary. These are the integral components. In the case of the living human body you have to at least have a head and a torso. Um, that's one type of relation, that of components. Some uh, concepts are components of other, uh, can be viewed as components of other concepts. Um, some uh, are properties of other things. So um, uh, in the case of properties, the order uh, in which we list the properties uh, does not matter. Um, but there is a strict inheritance from further up the is a hierarchy along the dimension of generality. So if something more general along that axis has a certain property, everything below it is strictly going to have that property as well. Uh, components, properties, and finally contextuals. Contextuals are things that we typically associate with a concept, but uh, none of them are, strictly speaking, necessary for identifying that concept as that concept. At the same time, every concept has certain contextuals. Every concept has certain things with which we typically associate it. Uh, and unlike the inheritance with properties, the inheritance with contextual elements can be overridden. Now, the geometry of the unified space is um, an interesting and complicated thing that, that I'm still very much working out, and I'll come back to this at the end of the talk. But it, it, in order to make sense of the unified space, we need to include elements of Euclidean geometry, yes, but also so-called elliptical geometry and hyperbolic geometry. So if you're familiar with Euclid's uh, fifth postulate, uh, the idea that if you have a plane uh, and uh, a line on that plane, uh, and you have a point that's not located along that line, there should be one and only one line that you can draw through that point that will not intersect the uh, first line. That's uh, the fifth postulate as Euclid formulates it. In elliptical geometry, there are no parallel lines. Uh, so for any line on the plane and any point not on that line, 
any line whatsoever that you draw through the point is going to intersect the first line. That's because the geometry of such a space is curved. And certain aspects of the unified space are going to have that sort of curvature. Um, there's another kind of geometry that's called hyperbolic. And in a hyperbolic geometry, uh, if you have a plane and a line on the plane and a point not on that line, you can draw at least at least two lines through the point that will not intersect the first line. That is, uh, space is curved, but it's curved in an inverse sort of way that spreads the lines apart. Uh, and why, why do we need this hyperbolic uh, element uh, of geometry? Well, for any two-dimensional slice that we make through the unified space, for any line that we draw through that plane, for any point in the plane that does not lie on that line, there's going to be at least two and possibly unboundedly many lines through the point that do not intersect the first line. What does this translate to in terms of conceptual frameworks? Well, it means that for any different concept, we can relate it to un potentially unboundedly many different domains. We can think of uh, a human being, for example. We can think of a human being as a biological organism. We can likewise think of a human being as a kind of computational framework. We can think of a human being as a exercise in moral philosophy and so on. All of these are equally valid ways of conceptualizing um, one and the same human being. Um, so it seems self-evident to me that if we're going to make sense of the world uh, conceptually, if we're going to create a geom geometrical representation for our conceptual frameworks, uh, a strictly Euclidean geometry is not going to be sufficient. If you look at the color space, it clearly has uh, a certain elliptical geometry to it. Um, if you um, look at the various ways of conceptualizing, for example, a human being, there's a hyperbolic geometry to that. Um, so now to, to talk uh, at least um, uh, a while here in the remaining uh, time available about the, the algorithm that's driving the um, unified conceptual space theory. Um, it takes uh, an initially minimally partitioned space and it continually divides and subdivides that space into finer and finer distinctions according to the specification of the algorithm, occasionally erasing lines or shifting lines to other uh, places, but for the most part adding new lines in. One of the very first distinctions that we learn to make as very young infants is the uh, conceptual distinction between the self and the other. Uh, we can also think of this as the distinction between the self and the world, or between, just more generally, between the self and the non-self. Then as we develop as children, we learn to distinguish between the mind and the body when we're thinking of ourselves. We learn to distinguish between objects, happenings, and properties when we're uh, thinking about the world. Then uh, as we grow, we make finer and finer distinctions. As I say, we learn to distinguish perhaps unconscious thought from pre-reflective, from self-conscious thought. We, we learn to distinguish between actions that are intentional and events that just happen. You know, ones where somebody actually is intending something to happen versus when things just occur. Um, things like earthquake, unless they're acts of God, they just happen. But if I take a pen and throw it across the room, that's clearly an intentional act. Uh, and likewise, we can, we can make finer and finer distinctions in the world we observe around us between the mental and the physical, um, between different kinds of properties, what uh, uh, some philosophers call primary versus secondary properties. So primary properties are meant to be ones that are intrinsic to the, the thing itself, independent of us. Secondary properties are meant to be properties that we attribute to um, the thing. Uh, that we're observing, uh, where, uh, for example, color is meant to be a secondary property because it's very clearly 
uh, dependent on the way that we are observing something as opposed to mass, which every organ, uh, intelligent organism in the universe, or so we imagine, is going to calculate uh, mass the same way. Um, but as I say, the, one of the very first distinctions, if not the very first distinction we learn to make, is the one between the self and the other. Uh, and the child development uh, psychologists see this as uh, foundational for our further uh, cognitive development. Um, as I say, it, it helps us go on to distinguish between intentional actions and mere happenings or events, uh, between my throwing the pen across the room versus an earthquake happening. Uh, it helps us uh, to be able to distinguish between mental stuff and physical stuff and uh, some people perhaps to become Cartesian dualists. Uh, and uh, as I say, it allows us to make this distinction, um, or at least philosophers anyway, to make this distinction between primary and secondary properties, between properties that we see as being intrinsic to the things we're observing versus properties that we see as being very much bound up with how we are observing. Uh, so now the, the algorithm, um, and the basic idea of the algorithm uh, is, is very, very simple, um, almost uh, exceedingly so. Um, and that's intentional because uh, this algorithm is meant to uh, apply in uh, pretty much exactly the same way regardless of context for us as conceptual agents. Uh, at the same time, certain elements of the algorithm are clearly needing more detailed uh, filled in and, and we'll, we'll come to some of the places where that detail is missing. Um, but the basic idea is that, okay, you start with um, a very minimal uh, structure that uh, is more or less um, somehow hardwired into us when we're born, and it's exceedingly minimal. Um, but it uh, uh, predisposes us necessarily, um, you know, if we do go on to develop uh, conceptual agency, conceptual frameworks, it predisposes us to divide the world up into objects and actions and properties, and we really cannot imagine dividing the world up in any other way than that. Uh, so for any given point uh, in this initial space, we can expand it into uh, a subspace with its own set of integral dimensions. Uh, between any two points in the space, we can add a third point uh, wherever a point is a maximum point along some dimension, we can add a new maximal point. We can extend that dimension. Uh, for any given point in the unified space, we can specify its properties. Um, that's minimally its integral dimensions. Its contextuals, those are the other things that we normally associate with that thing in question. Uh, for more concrete uh, object and action event concepts, we can describe uh, the components of the concept, um, minimally its integral components. Uh, and what's driving this algorithm, uh, if there, there really is such an algorithm, and I, I believe there is, um, are evolutionarily ancient emotions. Uh, these provide uh, the necessary and essential foundation for all of our uh, higher order uh, cognition. Uh, evolutionary evolutionarily ancient emotions in coordination um, with sensory motor interaction and consequent experience. Uh, and I use the term sensory motor interaction or sensory motor engagement um, because I'm talking about uh, something that is simultaneously sensory and motor engagement at the same time. So it's not as if we take in information through our sensory modalities and then process it and then output it in terms of motor output. No, the sensory and the motor are always and uh, continually very much bound up with each other in a very complex circular feedback loop. <coughs> and then you know, for those uh, agents who are capable of it, then the algorithm is, is further driven by explicit reflection, our capacity to think about our own thoughts, to think about our own limitations, our own uh, understandings of things.
Um, the unified conceptual space theory and, and this algorithm for defining concepts within the unified conceptual space makes a number of claims that, that I believe are empirically testable. First of all, that all concepts, uh, as concepts are defined by the theory, can adequately be described by this same basic algorithm, the same recipe for um, concepts. And, and that algorithm, as I say, says that uh, um, certain concepts uh, have uh, components, but only the, the concrete objects and the concrete action events uh, do. Um, all concepts have properties um, of which uh, one or more will be integral uh, dimensions, uh, integral properties. Uh, and all concepts have uh, contextual elements with which they're associated. Uh, any point in the unified space can be expanded into a subspace with its own integral dimensions. Um, for any dimension through the unified space, we can, and any two points uh, along that dimension, we can either create a new point in between the two, or we can extend the dimension to a new limit. And that's the basic al algorithm. Um, <coughs> any concepts should fit this formula as well or better than other existing schemas. Uh, and I think they do. Uh, any necessary tweaking should only indicate a, a gap or a fixable error in the theory. Uh, now, back when I was a doctoral student at Sussex University, UK, and then writing up my thesis at the University of Hivda and then the University of Lund in Sweden, I wrote a software application in the form of a mind mapping program for translating the unified conceptual space theory into a simple mind mapping software mm -hmm. uh, in order to be able to uh, explore the limitations of the theory in order to be able to make possible uh, empirical testing, which, as I say, I've been trying to get money for ever since. Um, and one of the ideas with this uh, mind mapping software is to use it in order to locate, uh, in order to identify gaps in the theory or errors in, in the, the current algorithm. Um, the concepts of any human society and any language community should easily divide into the three basic proto-conceptual categories of objects, properties, and action events. Every human language should be able to express those categories easily. It would appear, at least to the best of my exploration so far, that every human language we're aware of can do so. Um, supporting evidence uh, for the innateness of the proto-conceptual categories of uh, proto-object, proto-property, proto-action event should be forthcoming from child development studies. And I think there, there is at least good preliminary indication uh, that this is so. So, um, what are the, the strengths of taking uh, an algorithmic approach um, to describing our concepts and conceptual frameworks? Uh, what's th what are the strengths of this particular approach? Well, it's not at least immediately obvious what concepts the algorithm here cannot handle. Um, it's, it's very general. You could argue that it's too general, uh, in some ways it probably is, but there's no concepts that it's cl not clearly able to, to take on. Uh, at the same time, uh, it's, it's, the, the approach is clear about what it's not uh, trying to handle. So um, the unified conceptual space theory and, and the algorithm underlying it, they're not trying to describe the motivational system or the sensory motor system. They're not trying to address issues of embodiment and embeddedness, as important as these are. Uh, embodiment is the idea that every uh, living agent has a certain physical form with which it interacts with its physical environment and which defines the possibilities for interaction with that environment. Embeddedness is the idea that every living organism is embedded in a particular physical <coughs> and for some of us at least social context which likewise uh, sets boundaries on the possibilities for interaction. Now another strength of uh, the unified conceptual space theory and, and the algorithm under it 
is that you can build things with it now, and indeed I have built this simple mind mapping program, although I really would like the opportunity to re-implement it in more efficient code and start addressing some of the, the gaps that I, I realize are in that software uh, you know, just by my research of the last few years uh, since I, I wrote the software. Um, in general speaking, more algorithmic means more empirically testable. So one of the, the limitations of the original conceptual spaces theory is that because it's only providing a scaffolding, it's very difficult to do empirical testing of it. Uh, Petra Yerenforsch is very proud, and justifiably so, that there has been confirmation of the convexity of concepts within the color space across 130 different languages, I think. Um, you know, at the sa uh, same time, the notion of convexity, the, the idea that if you have uh, a concept at one point in a given spa a conceptual space and another concept at another point, then um, uh, and both of those belong to the same uh, conceptual space, then any points between those two points along a straight line uh, should also fall within the same conceptual space. So, for example, if, if this point uh, falls within the color red and this point falls within the color red, then any points between them must also fall within the color red. That's the notion of convexity. Now, it is true that conceptual spaces theory is the first uh, theory of concepts to make this commitment to con uh, conceptual convexity explicit. I actually think that this notion of convexity is implicit in any prototype-based uh, theory of concepts, any prototype-based approach to cognition. And the, the uh, insight of conceptual spaces theory is in making that commitment explicit. Uh, but in any case, uh, the, the explicit uh, uh, empirical testing of conceptual spaces theory to date has been primarily within this area of establishing the convexity of concepts. I think with the unified conceptual space theory and the software that I've written, I can take the empirical testing several steps further. Um, but there are some weaknesses, and uh, it's important to address these. The algorithm, as you've probably guessed uh, already, is m still massively under constraint. Uh, this is a bit ironic because one of my motivations in, in writing the mind mapping software in the first place, um, you know, in addition to translating the unified conceptual space theory into the form of a software program showing that I could do such a translation, I also wanted to improve upon existing mind mapping software. If you've used any of the existing mind mapping software, you know that it's incredibly under constrained. And, and that's one of the big problems that people have with using mind mapping software. It lets you throw down ideas and draw lines between them any which way whatsoever. So the, the, the mind mapping program that I wrote uh, is based you know, on the unified conceptual space theory, which is based itself on conceptual spaces theory. It does constrain the possibilities, but it doesn't constrain the possibilities nearly as much as it needs to. Um, and in particular, uh, this is true when it comes to the geometry of the space. I really need to map out the different kinds of geometry within the space a lot more clearly, the, the Euclidean versus the elliptical versus the hyperbolic geometry. Um, the, the basic driving motivation here is that all one's earlier choices, all one's earlier experiences should constrain all one's subsequent choices and experiences. So everything you do in your life is a bit like painting yourself more and more and more into a corner of a room, uh, where once in a while we're able to get out of that corner, but in general we are increasingly uh, uh, limiting our options, uh, even as we, we become better at the uh, conceptual uh, uh, tasking that we do. Now, even if it weren't the case um, that uh, the, the current algorithm in my theory uh, were not you know, massively under constrained, even if the, the mind mapping program that I wrote wasn't massively under constrained, there's a, a more general problem, which is that algorithmic approaches of, of whatever kind um, pose certain trade-offs. Some things cannot be captured well by algorithm. 
it may be possible in principle to capture them by algorithm, but it may not be useful whatsoever. Uh, and some things, at least uh, possibly, may not be capturable by algorithm at all. Uh, Roger Penrose, who I disagree with on many, many things, but he is very strongly of the opinion that there is something essential about uh, human conceptual cognition that is not capturable by algorithm. Um, uh, and, and many other people hold that intuition as well. Uh, and, and I myself at least have the worry that aspects of conceptual uh, agency are not capturable even in principle by algorithm. Um, there's also the risk that by focusing on algorithms, by taking an algorithmic approach, what one ends up with in describing human cognition or animal cognition is something <coughs> that is over-intellectualized. Um, and you can't really get away here from le language or lexical labels. I can draw pretty pictures with my software, uh, perhaps even prettier than the existing mind mapping software, I'm not sure. Um, I can give you the shape of concepts in a visual form, but at the same time, in order to make sense of those, you have to attach uh, a lexical label. Um, nevertheless, I think the, the approach outlined by the conceptual spaces theory developed by the unified conceptual space theory is still a bit closer um, to treating concepts more as knowledge how rather than propositional knowledge that, and in doing so, moving concepts a bit away from being so obviously dependent on language. You know, there are philosophers and, and uh, empirical researchers out there who think that if you don't have a language, you don't have conceptual cognition. There are even people like uh, psychiatrist uh, Zoltan Tori who say you don't have language, you don't have a mind at all. And, and I really want to oppose that idea. So. I'm at the, the end of my talk here. Uh, I don't know how the stream quality has worked because it's still telling me on the control page that the stream status is bad, but if this hasn't been sufficiently uh, clear, if it's not clear when I listen back to it, then I'll, I'll delete and re-record it later when I have a, a better cognition. And I also will at some point figure out how to do the, the screen sharing again things have switched around with the closing down of Google's Hangouts on Air and the shift to YouTube Live, and I still haven't figured out the changes. So thanks very much for listening, and I'm going to uh, close out the, the talk for today, and I will uh, schedule another of these talks for the near future. Um, on the subject of conceptual agency or consciousness or very likely some combination of the two. Thank you very much.